Uh, my name is Susan Kaplan. I'm the vice chair of the Upper Valley Group Sierra, of, of the Sierra Club. And um, I'm really delighted that uh, you've all made your way here on an absolutely gorgeous day. And there are so many reasons not to be here, but there are two very good reasons to be here. Um, and as Greg said, this is the third in the series, and uh, we've heard who the sponsors are. And the real, I think this really came from Carol and Joan. Um, Carol Weingeist, Thank you. here you are back there. Um, and the, the idea is lovely because it's not a lecture. This is really a conversation of women um, in New Hampshire and Vermont who really demonstrated exceptional leadership or inspiration uh, related to stewardship, conservation, um, and innovation. And um, it really gives us an opportunity to hear their stories. How did they get where they are? How did they, why did, why did they choose to do what they're doing? And then we really want, uh, at the last second half, kind of last half hour, is to engage, like to have questions, to have conversations between the two of them, with you, with Christina and Joan. So uh, Alex, I would love for you to come up. Alex Conroy Conrad is going to introduce Christina Martz. Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Um, I'm Alex, uh, Alex Conrad, and I'm currently um, an SCA intern at the two parks that Christina works at, um, Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historical Site, Historical Park um, in Woodstock, and uh, St. Gaudens National Historic Site in Cornish, New Hampshire. Very long names, um, say that five times fast, uh, it's very hard. <laughs> um, the SCA, uh, or the Student Conservation Association, is a nonprofit organization that focuses on getting young people excited about working in conservation. Um, one of the ways that they do this is by providing young people like myself with um, paid internships in interpretation, maintenance, uh, collections, natural resources, every department um, that you can uh, imagine. Um, I chose to become uh, an SCA intern because um, I like going to work every day and um, knowing that I'm helping the environment sort of little by little um, to know that I'm doing something good. And uh, Christina Martz certainly does just that, um, something really good. Um, Christina has been part of the National Park Service for over 17 years, um, working not only as the Deputy Superintendent of two national parks, but also serving as one of the first people on the ground opening Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument in Maine. Um, although her resume is quite impressive, uh, what is more remarkable is her dedication to our two parks. Christina always has time to chat with me, um, despite having much to do in the office. Um, she uh, similarly never misses an opportunity to include every member of the park um, in fun slash difficult decisions, um, such as which art will appear on Vermont's 2020 quarter. Um, keep an eye out, it'll be, it should be good. Um, so Christina is certainly an extraordinary leader, um, and I am so honored to welcome her to the podium, um, Superintendent Christina Martz. Thank you, Alex. I'll just say we are in good hands with the future generation of women conservation leaders that are coming into our workforce right now. I am inspired by all of the young women who work at both Marsh Billings and St. Gaudens, giving their great talent to those two parks. So thank you for that, Alex. And thank you to the Student Conservation Association and the Sierra Club and the Montshire for hosting this fabulous series. It's a wonderful honor to be a part of it. And the work that you're not doing here, but the work that you do across your organizations in celebrating and promoting the women the role of women in conservation is, is phenomenal. Thank you so, so much. 
And it is a complete honor to be doing this with Joan Hoffman, too, who we have several connections with. Uh, Joan also served as an artist in residence at the, the National Park, and she's also a, a neighbor of mine. And before uh, tonight's uh, event, we had a chance to get together at the South Royalton Co-op and have a cup of coffee and just connect with one another and share some of our, our stories about what set us on our, our journey. And that conversation with Joan really inspired me to think about how I wanted to talk about uh, my path of, uh, on, in conservation and how we might talk about that together. And I'm very interested in this idea of the power of stories, particularly the power of stories connected to place, but more specifically, the powers of stories connected to place that inspires a stewardship ethic in us. And that's really been the, the heart of, of my journey. Um, and I thought I would just quickly ask you, all of you I know have stories of your own that have set you off on your journey and certainly have brought you in on a beautiful night like tonight for, for this lecture series. So just take a moment and think about those three top memories that you have in your journeys that have brought you here this evening and has set that value of conservation deep in your heart and, and your work. Just three top memories. One. Two, three, and just hold on to those as we venture together with, with Joan and I sharing our stories. And please bring your stories into the room as we expand that, that dialogue. So I'll just share three of, of my stories along the way. Um, and certainly the, the first in that series starts off as a, a wee one, my founding stories, as perhaps many of your uh, memories that, that came up to you um, might have been as a, a child um, in, the, in the lands that you, you grew up in. For me, that was the suburbs of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I was just a wild child. I just loved playing outside to the point where having to come in, you know, mom would have to get out the, the hose and wash me down before I could come into the, the house. So I just loved being outdoors. And I have some great memories of the cicadas in the trees, the fireflies in the meadows, the first lunar moth I ever saw on an oak tree. But I also have a lot of memories of the stories of that place. I was the sixth generation to grow up in that landscape. So in addition to my memories of growing up there as a youth, I also had the memories of my family, of that land being farmland, and where the cow tracks used to be on the hillsides, where the chicken coop used to, to be, where Aunt Jane used to plow the, the field just down the road a little bit. And as I was growing up, that was residential. As I went in my, to my teenage years, the amount of development around that area skyrocketed. As I started to get into about 16 or so and I got my, my first driver's license, I went around and I drove a mile, one mile radius around where, where I lived and I counted the number of houses that I remember just in my short lifetime being built and it was over a thousand. So it was a landscape that went over drastic change, and it had a huge impact on me. And I felt like an outcast, quite frankly, at that point. That wild child just didn't feel like a part of that place anymore. And I felt rather driftless. And I also felt frustrated and unempowered. And I was set wondering. I knew I wanted to work in conservation. I knew this wasn't right. I knew there was a better way to do things. And I wanted to figure out what that was. I just wanted to make a difference so that didn't happen somewhere else. And so I went and I studied environmental resource management, 
That was helpful, but that just didn't quite do it. I went on adventures. I um, traveled about a year across country looking for what those special places are in our vast national landscape. Visited tons of national parks, of course, along that that journey. I worked at an organic farm for a while. I lived in the yurt in the woods for a bit. Um, and I just explored and I listened and I started to recognize that in all of this, both from my, my childhood experience and from looking at these special places across the country um, that I was experiencing, that there is such a power in place. And that that power in place has the ability to shift the conversation. Um, but that wasn't quite the full story. That wasn't quite the full, full answer. I eventually stumbled onto landscape architecture because it was a field where we could take this opportunity of place and really craft solutions that integrate both nature and culture in different ways of working with uh, the environment to create places within, within our community. And again, some of those tools that landscape architecture provided were wonderful, but it wasn't quite the, the full story. At that point, I was still in school and I was stumbled on this concept of landscape narrative. That places have stories. The stories of the people who live there, the stories of the people who go and experiences them. And that those stories can be powerful in creating linkages um, and opening up discussions in terms of what we value and what we want to see for the future. I also had a wonderful advisor at the time who was helping me with this exploration and, and journey. And at one point I went into his office and he was a uh, quiet Midwesterner guy, kind of subtle, played things down a little bit. And he said to me, I have a project that you'll love. Now he doesn't usually talk about that. Usually he would say something like, you know, I have something going on that might interest you that you might want to be part of. But no, he said, I have a project that you will love. So no matter what he said after that, the answer was yes. <laughs> I want to be involved. And the project that he had was helping with a design charrette for developing the first forest management plan for a new park in Vermont called Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historic Site. So we loaded up into the, the car, traveled the 500 miles from where we were at the university, and we stepped into the new visitor center at this new national park in Woodstock in Vermont. And I was greeted with this interpretive exhibit that said, people taking care of places. And after all of that wondering, the hairs on my arm stood up and it felt like a homecoming. That I had found my place, a national park dedicated to the history of conservation stewardship that was looking at creating opportunities for having discussions and dialogue for the, the conservation ethic of our time that is based on this idea of people taking care of the special landscapes. So that brings us to the kind of establishing uh, story. So I've had the wonderful opportunity of working for Marsh Billings for the, the last 17 years. As we were just getting started there, the work that I was doing was a lot about creating community connections because it was a new national park. And there, while it wasn't one of the most uh, controversial national parks to be created, it still had some concerned community members for it and not a lot of depths of relationships. So a lot of that work was thinking about how we created a national park that was also part of this amazing community and amazing landscape around, around Woodstock. And that's where the power of landscape narratives again came 
into the, the forefront with me and thinking about how we can draw the stories of the people of that place in helping of the planning of a, a new national park unit. So we went on and created a, a memory workshop where we invited some of the local foresters in the area who had worked those woodlands for generations to share some of their tales. Um, and then we also worked with two amazing graduate students who went out into the local community and conducted oral histories of the whole area. And it was amazing the way that people opened up to these two young people that were just so wonderfully inquisitive and just wanting to hear about what they valued about the national park and this larger landscape that we were all part of. And that really helped set the tempo and the relationships for, for Marsh Billings and some of the work that we do around stewardship and around creating connections with not just the public coming in the door, but also the communities of which we, we are a part. The other thing that happened during the, those very early years for me at Marsh Billings is I realized I didn't have a clue the full power of the organization that I was working for this organization called the National Park <coughs> Service. Remember I told you I spent a year traveling around the country. I bet you many of you have visit national parks um, throughout your, your past too, and you have a connection to them. And you know, the national parks are amazing in that they are these iconic landscapes, but they are so much more than what most people understand them to be. And I started to learn that in my years in working at Marsh Billings Rockefeller. To really understand the full power of the diversity of the national park system, which includes how many units? Guesses? You guys can't guess. <laughs> we got some ringers. Oh, 150? Higher? 220. Higher. Oh, it's, over 400. it's over 400 units of the National Park Service. And I didn't realize at that time when I came to work for the National Park Service. And what is amazing within those 400 units is the wonderful diversity that they hold in these beautiful, incredible, natural landscapes, in these amazing scenic landscapes in these very powerful historic sites that tell the incredible narrative of what we value as a country. And does it in a way that not only captures the, that past history of the development of our country, but in, does so in recognizing that it's still undone that both in terms of the places that need protected and the stories that need to be told, we are a work in, in progress. And that really started to make me appreciate what an amazing organization that the National Park Service is and the role that it plays within our, our nation and our country as a pillar, as a central pillar of, of one of our, uh, a part of our, our democracy. But again, that is, it's a, it's a work in progress and that narrative for those places is still not complete. We do that work at at Marsh Billings. Uh, Marsh Billings was set up to tell the stories of the stewards of the site, Marsh Billings and Rockefeller. But as Joan has reminded us, and our interns remind us, and my staff reminds us all the time, it is so much more than that. And specifically, it includes an incredible uh, story of women conservationists at the site. Um, that we're just starting to crack open and share with the, the visitors to the park in new ways, thanks to the great work of some of our interns who are, who are there now. And the story of the Park Service as a system is still evolving. There were just over the last um, 20 years, uh, about 20 more units that were, uh, were added, uh, including some that start to tell the LGBTQT story 
that had not been told within the National Park Service system sites and, and many others. So I was very interested in really thinking about um, those stories of the, the Park Service at large that are relatively incomplete that we still need to push on to make sure that we are telling and are inclusive of. The, my third story is a, is a growing narrative. Um, and it happened just uh, a couple years ago in, in 2016. I was able to put some of the experience of the startup work at Marsh Billings into play in starting up a new unit, uh, the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument Unit um, in Maine that's located adjacent to Baxter State Park and it's an 87,500 acre unit. I was notified just uh, a week before the opening that we think something's going to happen up there. We'd love for you to go up and uh, work on some of the community engagement elements of opening up this, this new national, national park. So I hopped in my car with essentially a trunk full of, of clothes, a sleeping bag, because I wasn't sure where I was gonna land, uh, a computer, a Wi-Fi hotspot, and a desktop printer, and went up there, and uh, one other staff member and I uh, were there for the opening of uh, the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. And it was a true honor to be on the ground for this, this new unit. And unlike Marsh Billings, this establishment of this new unit was somewhat controversial. It has essentially ripped communities apart. And there was neighbors battling neighbors in terms of whether or not a new national park unit um, in their community was, was a, good, a good thing. And I really had to draw deeply on some of that work and um, some of that experience around narrative, around storytelling, around connecting to place, to really come up with a, a strategy that would allow us to arrive in sight in this new place with a community that was so divided and create conversations that we could then grow and build together um, in creating a vision for, for this new, new monument. Um, so we opened the visitor center. It was um, the, the, the towns of Millinocket and uh, Medway and Patton were mill towns. Um, and the mill industry essentially bottomed out several decades to go and just created a huge economic shift um, in this community that the communities were still struggling to find, to find ground on. Our first visitor center welcome station was in the heart of downtown Millinocket, which was just a one road uh, little, little strip with a couple storefronts. Many of them had been vacant for eight or more years. Uh, there was only a couple of those storefronts that were, were open. So we s popped up our arrowhead there, we set up a desk, um, and we just essentially welcomed people in. And a big part of my job was just to listen to their stories. Just to listen to what they valued of this place. I remember a gentleman coming in and just, really just talking about all of the time that he spent in this landscape as, as a youth. And I realized that those stories that they have of the place needed to be a part of how we move forward with the planning for the new monument. One of the things that the director did, uh, then uh, John Jarvis in the um, lead up to the establishment of the monument is that he promised the community within six weeks of the National Park Service having boots on the grounds, we would be holding community listening sessions. Mm -hmm. So, and in order to do that, you really need to think through the process of which you're going to open up your doors to invite the community in for these big conversations. Um, and we realized that what they had been doing in the past in terms of town forums wasn't working because they were just people talking at people, not 
people talking to one another. So we intentionally structured our community involvement to have these listening sessions where we broke them out into um, smaller groups and asked them to share with one another what they valued about this place and what their hopes for the future were, to add their stories to the discussions of what they want to see uh, this, this new National Park Service to become. And it completely changed the relationship with, with the community. That work continues today. It's, it's on, ongoing. Uh, some of those conversations that were started got turned into some great partnership community projects. There's an oral history project that's going on with the, the local library up there that's capturing the stories officially of uh, some of the people who have grown up in the lands that have become Katahdin. There's an incredible uh, place-based education uh, effort going on with local teachers who are introducing their students to the monument and asking them to be part of the conversation of envisioning uh, its, its future. But again, it all evolves around this idea of stories connecting to place, connecting to stewardship. And I really think that uh, that's key to the work that, that we have in front of us as we think about what inspires uh, stewardship for, for our day is thinking about the stories that each of us bring into, into that conversation. So thank you for that. Joan is a, is a newbie to Vermont. Um, I'm not a Vermont resident, so I'm more than that. Um, but the the, the sense of place here and out west, I think, is, will be palpable as, as, uh, as we listen to Joan. She's a painter. She's a teacher. She's a conservationist. Um, Joan <coughs> paints outdoors, um, which is called plein air painting, correct? And um, one of the, the phrases that you wrote really comes alive right now, which is, you know, what you do in your paintings is giving art a voice to inspire conservation. And I just, I really hear that tonight. So, there are two big paintings that are easy to see. There are two on the floor and there are lots and lots of things. So, um, when we wrap up, I hope you'll take an opportunity to come and see some of the, of the things, uh, some of the places she's been, some of the places she's loved. Um, Joan has a very strong connection to the national parks. Uh, she uh, was an artist in residence at uh, Yosemite National Park uh, in 2005, and then at the Marshall and Rockefeller National Historical Park in 2016, and uh, has a good fortune uh, in 2019 to go to Zion National Park as a, an artist in residence. Joan, uh, Joan is also a lifelong Sierra Club volunteer, and uh, she began hiking with the Sierra Club in 1963 with her friend when she was 13, and backpacked in the high Sierras. Uh, and she's been hanging out in national parks ever since. Uh, she is one of the most loyal and hardworking members of the Upper Valley Group's executive committee, and uh, she is traveled to gorgeous places with friends to paint and to stand in awe. Please welcome Joan Hoffman. I've got, got my two microphones. Um, and um, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm definitely the artist in the group. You know, my head's in the sky. and. Sometimes I forget things, so um, I actually wrote it all down. These are my paintings. And um, so I am thrilled to be part of the Women in uh, Conservation series. Um, I don't know whose idea it was, but some of us got together, Christina, Carol, some from Sierra Club, Kevin from SCA and said, wouldn't it be fun to hear the stories of women? So to be invited to tell the story is thrilling. Um, 
You know, I look back and I actually do have a pretty interesting story. Um, surprises me sometimes. So don't underestimate what you are doing and the, you know, how connected to the landscape you might be and how connected to conservation you might be. And you might think, well, I don't do anything. I write a letter once in a while or I, whatever it might be. All that makes a difference. And I think the biggest difference I've noticed in conservation is talking one-on-one -on -one with somebody and saying, boy, this is my idea. And it makes a huge difference. So don't underestimate. Also, I want to know how many painters there are in the group that, and you don't have to be a good painter, just so whether you, OK, we've got a few painters. Um, I'm going to tell you more about my whole theory on whether we're good or not. And, um, that's not part of the story. That's not really relevant. And I want to bring in some of that conversation to the concept. So I thought I should get a little bit into my background. Um, I am new to Vermont, grew up in Los Angeles. And um, boy, at 13, I could get out of town. That just thrilled me. I didn't know what backpacking was. I didn't know where I was going. I had to be sponsored. My parents weren't there. Um, I, they didn't sell sleeping bags in 1963, if you can believe that. I'm that old. Um, I made my first sleeping bag. Um, luckily, I knew how to sew. Uh, it was, you know, all these things are like, that's kind of crazy. So I. Um, you know, but the landscape was so different in the High Sierras than it was in Los Angeles. You know, I grew up in the 50s in Los Angeles and the smog and, you know, one of the most polluted cities in the country at the time. Um, so I got out of Dodge all through high school. Every year I would volunteer. I could work on Sierra Club trips. I could do service trips. I, you know, met wonderful people. Um, one of the fun trips was hiking the Nepali coast in Kauai. Um, you know, I was, what's the Nepali coast? Well, I'll go. <laughs> so I learned a lot about the landscape by just, you know, going out and experiencing it. So my story is often just how I brought this experience back painting and connecting to conservation. So um, one of the high school trips, it wasn't high school, I was in high school, um, but was a volunteer or a service trip with Sierra Club on the Nepali coast. Uh, another chance was Yosemite and going to Tuolumne Meadows on a service trip with Sierra Club. Again, you know, I was probably 16 at the time. I could help cook and get the trip for free. So I was just stumbling along, but it sure looked fun to me. And um, one of the first things I heard on these Sierra Club trips was, you've got to go raft Glen Canyon. You've got to go raft Glen Canyon. You know, I'm like, raft? I don't know what that is. You know, I really, having grown up in LA, was clueless about <laughs> recreation. My parents golfed, and you know, my dad flew an airplane. And you know, I mean, it was fun stuff, but nothing that I connected to. So um, Glen Canyon it became very significant for all kinds of reasons as my story goes on. I had a chance to, but I was 13. I, you know, I didn't know what rafting was. Um, another fun trip I did was Capitol Peak in Colorado. And, you know, I kind of, Sierra Club actually was doing a lot of climbing on these trips in the 60s. And, you know, climbing, sure, I'll put a rope on and go up or down and, you know. So I learned a lot just on the fly by being a member of Sierra Club and going on the trips. They still run trips today. Um, they're just as wonderful, not quite as much climbing goes on. <laughs> a little more liability they're dealing with. Um, but Capitol Peak, um, you know, you can go on YouTube and get a, a the whole scenario. I was um, climbing a class four with the group going up. It was cloudy. I couldn't see. We were in the cloud and um, got to the top. And that was very cool. And the clouds opened up. And holy moly, you know, the way down was this knife edge ridge, they call it, drops 500 to 1,000 feet on both sides. There's no shelf to walk on. There's no trail. 
This is one of the 14ers in Colorado. You know, my eyes had got kind of big, and it's like, well, if everybody else is doing it, I guess I'm doing it. I wasn't going to down climb a class four. You know, um, nobody was going that way anyway. So I did some, um, you know, pretty edgy things. I guess I look back and happy I'm still here. <laughs> um, so that was, you know, but it got me connected in a way that I didn't know I even needed to be connected. and moved on from there. So um, a little more of my history. I went off to college at Colorado State University. I love the arts. I always wanted to be an artist. I didn't think I could get into any other college. And Colorado sounded good to me. I could go skiing. I could hike and you know hike in the Rockies. And um, they had an art department. So you know I really wasn't focused in college. Um, you know, maybe focus more on the mountains than anything else. And, um, you know, it's OK to sort of be, I think, not knowing what your final story will be. <laughs> um, you know, from there, um, met my husband. He was a potter. We married, uh, moved to Colorado, uh, moved to Steamboat Springs. I like to think of the John Prine song, we blew up the TV, we planted a little garden, <laughs> and um, moved to the country. So I was living now 12 miles outside of a small ski town in the Colorado Rockies at 7,000 feet, raising two little babies. And in the, right in my face was this developer that wanted to put in a ski area. They call it Lake Catamount. I called my valley Pleasant Valley. So it's been um, a very controversial development. It's, um, it's there, but not on the public lands. So I learned early on with the Glen Canyon that landscapes disappear. And here was my backyard going to disappear. I mean, they wanted to put Vail, Colorado in my backyard. I could have walked to the first ski run. And um, just little minor things were going to happen, like my well water was going to go down and air quality wasn't going to be very good. And now I couldn't drive in and out on my own road during how many years of construction would it be? And this was my whole life. So um, it really it sort of pushed me into conservation. And, and rightly so. I knew a lot about it, but I hadn't organized anything. We started a Sierra Club group called Trappers Lake Sierra Club. We named it Trapper's Lake because that is the cradle of the wilderness concept. Um, you know, I was learning all this stuff on the fly. Trapper's Lake is very near Steamboat Springs and the White Mountains in the Flat Tops Wilderness Area. There were two wilderness areas in our area that were class one wilderness areas. And all this I was learning while I was, you know, deciding I didn't want this ski area in my backyard. I'm a skier, but ski areas weren't doing a very good job. Um, with the environment and Sarvis Creek Wilderness Bill, or Sarvis Creek Wilderness had been declared in the 1980 Wilderness Bill in Colorado. And all the ski area wanted to do was just take a little bit of it, maybe 100 acres, and put it into ski development. My neighbor was a rancher who owned about 2,000 acres. And she wasn't for it either. I mean, how are you going to ranch next to a ski area? And all they did was put one ski run on her property, I mean, on the map, you know. And we were fighting right and left, and, you know, things were not going well at the beginning. Um, so that's how I really got into it, was this development in my backyard, which is very typical <laughs> um, of the way Sierra Club members get involved. And, um, you know, someone asked me, you know, well, you can't win this, Joan, they said. You know, and it really, you know, and I said, yes, we're going to win this one. And I had no clue. But, you know, if you don't put it out there that you're going to, you probably won't. And if anyone thought, um, by this time, I was sort of the Aaron Brockovich of Steamboat Springs in the 1990s as things got more intense and more intense. And you know they started, uh, they put in this lake, and there were um, 
white pelicans that came to the lake, but they were eating all their fish. So they called in Animal Damage Control, a federal agency that kills wildlife versus the Fish and Wildlife Service that enhances wildlife. And they were out there in their little rowboat shooting, trying to get rid of these white pelicans. Well, it wasn't hunting season, and there was no hunting season on white pelicans. And, you know, ooh, we had, by then it was like, okay, we can have fun with this one. I mean, it was terrible, it was tragic, but we got it on the front page of the newspaper that, um, you know, just this little development is killing white pelicans and didn't go over very good. Um, so this was ended up being a 15 year project. <laughs> and instead of taking public lands and developing it into a ski area, they pulled it back and did a housing development on mm -hmm. the land. And that was a good solution, I thought. So that was one thing and as I, got involved with that, you know, people, can't Sierra Club do something about this? Can't Sierra Club do something about that? Oh boy, you know, and I got good at saying no. Um, but another big issue in my area at the time was these coal-fired power plants. In, the, in 1992, um, an attorney and I got together and we said, the attorney said, I'm like, we are? <laughs> He said, we're taking them to court, Joan. And uh, a man named Reed Zars had grown up on a ranch right next to the coal-fired power plant. You know, I'm kind of hanging on like, okay, now we're gonna do this. Um, I didn't know anything about litigation, but I was the affected citizen. <clears throat> I would show up and say, well, you know, I can't paint these paintings with that dirty sky. You could actually see things going on where if you know anything about coal-fired power plants, they uh, soot blow on holidays when you can't you know, cite them for their violations. And you don't even know if it's a legal soot blowing or an illegal soot blowing. Um, too much detail to get into here, but they have continuous emission monitoring data on every stack in the 1990s. So 15 years later, we won the cases and there was a $160 million cleanup and a $170 million cleanup that came into Northwest Colorado. And I look back on that, and the only thing I lament was that we couldn't get a write-up on the economic development that Sierra Club, Sierra Club did the suits, brought to Northwest Colorado. The ski industry had not brought that much money in this, you know, it was an incredible economic development to go green. And to this day, they could even go greener because they have these huge facilities that they could put solar panels on and they could be making a gajillion dollars if they weren't trying to fight for more coal. So it's all political. And um, so all these things came together and I'm still like, boy, I just wanna go on a hike. <laughs> so um, let me see where my notes are. I, um, while I was raising my family, um, this painting is um, Steamboat Rock, the whole rock called the Steamboat Rock. This is the Green River. It's in Dinosaur National Monument. It was a backyard to Steamboat Springs, Colorado. And Steamboat is known for, you know, having 400 inches of snow every year. You know, it snows even in the middle of summer sometimes. Um, we had 59 frost-free days but they were not contiguous. <laughs> you didn't know if it was gonna snow on the 4th of July or 1st of September, so your gardens were really hard. I gave up gardening a long time ago. It was very frustrating. Um, but the one thing we could do was all this recreation that the Rocky Mountains had wonderful things. So as I'm rafting, going by Steamboat Rock, I'm like, what'd they name it after the town for? And my rafting friend said, no, 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 that's John Wesley Powell named that. And John Wesley Powell has a huge history in the West, um, started the US Geological Survey. He, and so in, the 18, in 1868, approximately, he um, rafted the Colorado River, first European American to do it. And probably Native Americans were out there, but maybe not doing the whole length of the river. So from about Flaming Gorge down to, through the Grand Canyon. 
You can see, um, if you've rafted, and maybe some of you have, um, the Grand Canyon, you can see an old wooden boat that was John Rossi Powell's. So I was learning all this history as I was going out on the landscape, and it just really connected to me to understand more Western history and to understand federal lands, public lands, national parks, BLM, Forest Service, Animal Damage Control, Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service. I mean, you know, how does it all fit together? And um, Wallace Stegner, great uh, writer, wrote a book called the Hun Beyond the 100th Meridian. And I finally discovered that. A wonderful book on public lands. I mean, the focus is not so much on understanding public lands, but he brings together all these elements and how, how we even in America have public lands. Other countries don't have public lands. Well, one, we took them from the Native Americans, but it became a federal reserve of land and that the states never have owned the land. So a contemporary issue going on right now is the state of Utah would love to take the public lands and have them become state lands, and they've been out there claiming that it used to be Utah's, and we want them back. Um, a lot of misinformation out there. So the more I could educate myself, the more I could bring the conversation to my friends and neighbors, and they were bringing it to me, telling me about the history they knew. It, it's just such a rich, wonderful history in America. Um, the public lands is one of our biggest treasures in America, I think. Um, the fact that I get to go paint them, that I've been at the Marsh Billings painting, um, thrills me the fact that I'm going to go on to Zion. But let me, um, so all this has brought me into this concept of how much I value my landscape, how much my, you know, not my personal history, but the history of my country is wrapped up in the landscape and how I was living this history as I was out there recreating. Um, and it's, it's such a rich history. So I want to jump into painting. And, you know, I was, it brought value to me to be on the landscape and I could understand the value of my paintings by painting a location that has so much history attached to it. So I began to really um, look more and more at what I really wanted to paint. I wanted to paint large, and I wanted to paint these wide open spaces. So if you're a painter, you know, sometimes it's frustrating. You can't get your vision into paint. My vision is how big everything is, how broad it is, how much depth of field there is, and how can I bring that into my painting? So the far one is Bears Ears, what? Is Bears Ears National Monument. It's very controversial right now. Uh, Obama declared it at the end of his presidency, and Trump has cut it way back. We don't know exactly how much he cut it because it all hasn't been decided. So the concept Christina brings up, the conversation's still going on. Um, your voice is important in protecting these landscapes. Um, some of my books that I have here in the Bears Ears National Monument has some of the most dense rock art, art on the stone walls, sick rock, and ruin sites ruin sites from a 1,000 years ago, um, anything from kivas to just um, stone structures that sometimes you can see what it was, and archaeologists. It's rich. Cedar Mesa is part of it. Um, it's this, uh, the, the heart of it, well, it's hard to tell what the heart of it is. I've been going to Bluff, Utah. It's south of Moab, about a two-hour drive. It's north of Monument Valley. Um, there's other national parks in the area. And it's an obscure location, but it's also a location with all these ruin sites and Native American history. And, and what's really been thrilling for me is to see how much the Native Americans have gotten into the conversation 
about protecting this area that's their area. I mean, it's where they, their history is. And so we're all tied together with this. Um, and let me, see. so painting, um, you know, early on, what does it matter if you do a painting? You know, who cares? Um, you know, I realized I'm never going to become famous. Um, <laughs> If you notice, there are not many women famous painters, and um, <laughs> Museum of Modern Art and others. You know, we see Mary Cassatt, and then we see George O'Keefe, and then we see Mary Cassatt, and then we see George O'Keefe. <laughs> women, winner, women painters in America, <laughs> and um, so you know. But there's so much more to painting. It's telling a story. It's bringing your vision to light. It's starting a cultural conversation. It's starting a conversation about the land, or if you, whatever you paint. Um, so I do a lot of teaching, and I like to let, you know, bring that conversation into my classes, that it's important that anyone that wants to paint, paints. That it's part of, it's like writing a, bo a book or writing a poem. It's all important. Don't undervalue it. And take it where it goes for you. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, I never was aspiring to be the next Andy Warhol or uh, George O'Keefe or George O'Keefe or George O'Keefe, you know. And, um, okay. <laughs> And um, I really am interested in, in what you are interested in. Questions um, for both of them? Questions for either one of them? Um, who, who has a question that you'd like to start with? Recently, I, I watched the Denver series on the national parks. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered if you could comment on it. I hope you didn't do it all in one sitting no. first. <laughs> five or six minutes, and I, I have five or six times. Yeah, you know, the Ken Bird series close. was a. Yeah. It's really close. Ten years singing. <laughs> it, you know, it's a, it's a visually stunning series that tells a lot of important chapters of the creation of the, the National Park Service. Um, and I think it has a lot of value. I think there's a sequel that needs to be done. And that sequel is the story of the creation of the parks after he left off to really show, as I mentioned when I was chatting, the full broad diversity that the National Park Service encompasses. So that's, that's my only critique of his, his beautiful work in that. Um, yeah, I've still got my mics on, so hang on to the mic. Are, are they working? Yeah. Uh, okay, so I like the Ken Burns series, how it um, talked about the artists out on the landscape, and that um, we have a very rich history in the painters painting on plein air. Um, I've been studying Beardstadt, and you know, people call him a second-rate painter. You know, people might call me a second-rate painter. I mean, I haven't made the big time. Um, but there's another story to be told. And um, with Bierstadt, he was a mountaineer. Art historians don't care that he was a mountaineer. In 1863, Bierstadt was taking his paints up Mount Evans in Colorado, a 14,000-foot peak. He was painting on plein air. I have a, a sample of Bierstadt painting on plein air. It's a totally different style painting than a studio work. And so, again, the conversation needs to keep evolving because we're tired of hearing Beards that was a second-rate painter. I mean, I, you know, it really doesn't matter. I mean, he was a painter. He's in our history. Call it good at that. Or add to the story. You know, Monet was sitting in his garden painting in 1863 coining the term Impressionism and the term on plein air. And Beardstadt was on Mount Evans. Now, where did he go to the art supply store to go get his paints? You know, Monet could just run to his studio. So it's a wonderful 
history of American landscape painters that we don't even begin to tell. And just to just quickly add to that to emphasize what, what Joan said, there we go. You know, the National Park Service certainly might not exist if it wasn't for those very early Hudson River School artists that went out there and brought back these stunning images of these sublime landscapes that then convinced Congress to set aside Yosemite. Without those artists making that statement of the spectacular nature of these places, certainly uh, the I don't you know the Park Service wouldn't be where where it is today without the role of of artists in conservation. Other, another question. Thanks again to both of you for, for presenting. Appreciate particularly, Joan, you're talking about the challenges to, to Paris years and, and the other federal lands. Yeah. But Christine, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the challenges to the National Park Service. I can imagine with the expansion, you need a lot more money, you need more staff. Uh, what are some of the challenges you have? Sure. <laughs> You're getting your, your exercises. You know, there, that can be kind of broken into a, a number of, of different categories. I'll just kind of touch on a couple of the, the top ones. Um, first, I, you know, we have been studying the creation of these new units that have, have come online. Um, one of the other hats that I, I wear is a member of the Stewardship Institute that's based at Marsh Billings Rockefeller and was created to look at uh, contemporary issues in uh, public lands management and support public land managers and new leadership skills. As part of that, we've um, kind of looked at new national park making models. A important element that is weaving into a lot of the, the new national parks is the role of private philanthropy. I mean, you certainly see that at uh, Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument, where the new unit was created with uh, the promise of, of donation. So I think as we are looking at new units in the Park Service, we're looking at some of those new management models that have really strong partnership elements to them that does um, at least support uh, a greater opportunity for, for sustainability. Um, in that, um, you know, the budgets for the, the Park Service at large have been level funded over, over the years, so that, of course, is uh, a, a growing concern. Um, and then I, I think that the context of public land management is, is changing. Things that certainly we talk about on a daily basis at uh, Marsh Billings in terms of some of our management challenges is looking at climate change looking at changes in visitor demographics um, and reaching new visitors to ensure that National Park Service remain relevant um, to, um, to our society. So th those are just some of the, the things that we're, we're thinking about and working on. interested several years ago. There's a woman in St. Kentucky, and she's written a book, and I believe it's called um, White Spaces, Black Faces. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then with more recent events, things that have happened where people like the fellows who were arrested in the Starbucks store, um, the women on the golf course in Pennsylvania who were confronted by the police because they weren't moving fast enough. Mm -hmm. And it brought up a conversation about places where black people, um, black, um, white people's spaces and black people's spaces. And, um, and I've been thinking about it more also because of the kids that I work with and think about how there's poor people's spaces and, mm -hmm. and middle class rich people's spaces and how to open the parks and our places like that to be more inclusive. And it seems like you've been thinking a lot about that, particularly when you look at the time. But I'm just curious about what other thoughts you've had about that. Yeah. Great topic. 
Thank you. That is such an important question um, on, again, so many, so many levels. Uh, let me start by saying I think there's a unique role for parks to step into some of our contemporary conversations regarding inclusivity. Um, I was, I literally just today got back from Booker T. Washington uh, National Monument in Virginia, uh, which is the birthplace of Booker T. Washington and where he lived as a boy before um, he was emancipated. And that staff there is having this conversation of how can we use these powerful stories that are embedded in some of our national park sites to really push on the, the conversation of uh, diversity and inclusivity in our, in our country. But I think your, your point is a, a larger one. I think as a um, institution, you know, the, the National Park Service has a critical need to be thinking about how to welcome greater diversities of visitors to all of our parks. Um, and that diversity is uh, across the spectrum um, from racial, ethnic, and uh, social and economical. Um, and that certainly, we don't have a silver bullet in terms of ways to do that. It's something that we talk about regularly on our staff. It's something that I know parks across the country are, are talking about and, and working on. Um, but we absolutely need to be thinking about how to do that. Part of the process and all that is to ask the question, what stories are we telling? And are they inclusive stories that people who do come see themselves in that stories? And even better, are they stories that can be co-generated with the people who represent some of these lesser told narratives of their connection to these, these places? Well, I've got the mics. Go. Sorry. <laughs> I don't want to set them off. Um, but it was fun, our conversation, Christina and I, just having our coffee. Um, you know, I'm always, where are the women artists? You know, what's the story? Um, we don't see them in America. We don't highlight them. We don't know who they are. And thinking after my artist in residency, what a wonderful collection is at um, the Marsh Billings. And can we go into that collection? We were just, you know, talking and and see who the women artists that were in that day and age collected and what were their stories and begin to add the story of women artists in America. And one of being an artist, one way art is valued in our country is how much money. And the museums want to keep that value up. And they're not going to bring in you know, Joan Hoffman that doesn't have that value and do some kind of exhibit. It's not worth their time. So that's why we keep seeing Mary Gazette and you know, George O'Keefe. But what the Park Service can do is bring that story um, they, I mean, you know, a light bulb went on. It, maybe it is through the Park Service that the story of women artists can be told. It, you know, maybe it's another venue, but, or opportunity. It, so it's just, it's, this is, you know, something, it's why it's so important to keep talking. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> so um, there's this seems a theme is stories, and um, I'm I'm actually interested, Christina, in the stories up around Katahdin. All of the stories that you gather, mm. what do you do with them, and how do you tell them, and where are they integrated? That yeah, what do you do with those? <laughs> That's such a, a great a great question too. Um, you know, let me first say that that Katahdin is a, a work in progress. You know, it has one permanent staff member and then some detailees like myself who go in there at different 
parts of the, the process to, to lend support. So everything is on kind of a slow, <laughs> a slow schedule. But those stories that have been gathered through the oral history project are being shared back out to the, the community. Um, and they're starting to serve as some of the um, underpinnings for some of the interpretive planning at the, at the park. So the narratives of the people who, who grew up there and experienced the landscape firsthand, again, through their, many of them through generations in their, their family and uh, working, hunting, fishing, and caring for that land in, in various ways are told as part of the, the narrative of the, of the site. The other way that we um, started to use it and are continuing to use it is in the planning process. So in those listening sessions, as we broke the um, community uh, groups that gathered into s some of the subgroups, they gathered around this big map of Katahdin. And we asked them to identify what places were special to them and why. And so they did this mapping exercises that l actually put a pin in certain places or identified a certain segment of stream and talked about the values that they saw of that place. And that can go into informing some of the uh, further development of some of the, the management plan and, and tapping that local knowledge and mixing it in with some of the, the other scholarship and uh, science-based analysis of the, the landscape there. Did you want well, the only thing I have to add, which is totally off the subject, but the interpretation that happens, I mean, it's not totally off the subject, but um, I was in um, the Sand Dunes National Monument or National Park in southern Colorado, looking out the picture window, looking across the San Luis Valley. You know, I'd been there painting. Um, and I read the sign that says, I am, if you see the mountains across the way, this valley, if you've been in Colorado, it's pretty big. And it says you are looking across the distance of the height of Connecticut. You can see these mountains every day. I mean, the air is clear. You're at 7,000 feet, I think. And, uh, you know, I'm like, I'm looking across Connecticut, uh, you know, and I bring that story partly because the interpretation just, you know, blew me away. That's what I want to paint, but also that's what a painter like Beardstadt was painting. Just the phenomenon that you could see so far. And anytime you look at the tag on a Beardstadt painting, they like to point out it's over the top, it's grandiose, it's not what's real, it's blah, blah, blah. No, these landscapes are phenomenal. They're not grand, you know, he wasn't over the top. He, he was just learning how to do distance and space. And he wasn't doing photorealism that, that can't show distance. A photo cannot show, it's something like 150 miles that you can see. A photo can't show that. So anyway, that's interpretation is yeah. so valuable. Joan, I'd love to know more about your art process. How do you pick the places that you paint? You talked a little bit about sure. kind of, you know, historical places, but how do you pick the perspective? What's your process like, um, etc.? Okay, okay. Um, well, I oil paint, but I didn't get into that until probably I was 40. And um, I had learned oil painting in college. You don't learn watercolor in college because it's a second rate medium. I mean, you know, where all this judgment is, I mean, the art world, the, the art historians are using language from the 1750s. They have not upgraded the language. They have not upgraded the story. Um, I am frankly appalled at my own profession <laughs> that can't change the story. but. So I painted watercolors because I wanted to learn them for about 15 years and exhibited watercolors. Then I, all these, you know, I was painting outdoors and wanted to switch to oils, so I painted the oils outdoors. In the meantime, um, you know, I've always been a Saracope member, 
going, taking my, I, but at that point, when I was 40, I had two teenage daughters, and taking them on raft trips and taking them um, hiking in Moab area, we would go and um, kind of right during the mo mountain bike boom that hit Moab and, and then boy, if you went a little bit south to Bluff, it was a lot more relaxed, you know, um, area. And I began, um, I was in Steamboat when a friend turned to me and said, you know, you wanna take people hiking and painting. And my reaction, I mean, I painted, I exhibited, I sold my work, but I'd never taken any place, anybody any place. And I said, no, that's, I mean, I almost call it a stupid idea until, you know, it's like, hmm, maybe that is an idea. Um, so the first groups I took were watercolors so we could do lots of hiking and do a little bit of painting. And, um, but then I realized I really wanted to be an oil painter. And I, I went to a talk and the guy was a inventor. And, and somebody in the audience said, um, how do you make a living? And I'm like, yeah, that's what I kind of wonder too, you know, with the art and, you know, I'm just selling as much as I can, but it's just barely making ends meet. And he said, oh, I just have faith. And I walked out of there going, maybe I'll have faith. <laughs> I'm not a religious person, but the idea, so it turned a corner for me where my dad actually was a salesman. I, he didn't give me the sales information that he had, but I think I picked it up. And I've never hesitated selling my work, and now I see how important it is to sell your work. It has nothing to do with whether it's your best painting. Um, it really has to do with someone connecting to art, and it's their inspiration. When they connect, you drive their creativity to think of something different or something unique or bring home something. I've had all kinds of experiences. One, this man walks into my art show and goes, I have to have this painting. I just have to have this painting. I just have to have this painting. My grandmother had, a, it was a barn with the light on it that looked a little pink. And next thing, this man is talking about his grandmother's house that was pink and she lived in Long Island. And, you know, and he went on and on and on. And, you know, you kind of want to say to him, well, that's not your grandmother's house, you know. <laughs> and, you know, but it's like, okay. Just because you painted the painting doesn't mean you know the story. And you, as a painter, have your reason for painting it. But the feedback you get is so much more powerful. And it's that painting that is that connection. And so I joke with my painters, people buy schlock all the time, why not your paintings? And <laughs> uh, you know, I don't really mean it seriously, but let the man buy my barn because it reminds him of his grandmother's house that you know, I don't have any connection to that story. Um, but did that answer enough of your questions? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, so it's just about 8 o'clock. Okay. And um, I am pretty confident that both Joan and Christina will be willing to answer individual questions as well. Mm -hmm. But I just want to wrap it up and respect people's time. And thank you both so much. This was really a wonderful, warm, inspiring conversation. So thank you. Thank you.